In today's broadcast, I would like to begin a study in faith. I've entitled this study, What to Do with Mountains. Now, what do you do with mountains? Well, in Scripture, we see believers do three things with them. They either climb them, claim them, or cast them into the sea. For example, Moses climbed a mountain and received a revelation. He received the law on Mount Sinai. Caleb claimed a mountain and received his inheritance. Jesus said if we had faith as a grain of mustard seed that we could cast any mountain into the sea, thus removing whatever would hinder what we need. Now, mountains are repeatedly referred to in the Bible, and so it must mean that there's some significance attached to the fact that God is often seen in relationship to mountains. For example, God gave the law from Mount Sinai. Abraham offered Isaac on Mount Moriah. Moses viewed the promised land from Mount Nebo, and Caleb claimed Mount Hebron and the surrounding hills, saying, Give me this mountain. And we're told again and again in Scripture that Mount Zion is the place from which the Messiah, Jesus, will rule when he returns. And his most remembered teaching, if you remember, was delivered from a mount. We call it the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Peter, James, and John witnessed his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. Daniel's vision of the establishment of the kingdom of God, the kingdom there, is depicted as a great mountain that fills the whole earth. Mountains are where Jesus would go to pray in order to be alone, and we're told the Mount of Olives is the place from which he ascended into heaven and to which he will return, the Mount of Olives. And mountains are what believers are said to be able to cast into the sea by faith, and on and on. And so the significance of mountains in all of these passages from Genesis to Revelation is that mountains are the largest objects on the landscape. They draw your attention. And so God appears in connection with mountains often to give the law from which he ascended, where he was transfigured, and to which he will return. You see, mountains are a place of superiority. Creatures have to look up to see who's on top of the mountain, God in this case, and one could not imagine the reverse of the situation with creatures on top of the mountain looking down into the valley where God would be. It's a natural place of defense also. It's a place, therefore, that has to be overcome. As we see in the case of Caleb in Joshua 14, he had to overcome Mount Hebron to take his inheritance. And then when Jesus tells us in Mark 11:23 that if we speak to the mountain, whatever hindrance that's in our way, if we speak to it in faith, it will be removed, he's thinking of this as mountain signifying something that have to be overcome. It's a place from which to rule. That's why we're told in Scripture that Jesus, when he returns, will rule from Mount Zion. You see, the king is elevated above his subjects. It's a place of solitude where you can go and pray, as Jesus did, because generally you're not going to find crowds on mountaintops. There are no shopping centers or freeways on mountaintops. And thus, we need to examine, because the Scripture speaks of them so often, what we should do with or about mountains. What are you going to do with the mountains that you encounter in your life? Are you going to climb them, claim them, or cast them into the sea? Well, depending upon the nature of the mountain, God expects a Christian to do all three. Some mountains have to be climbed if you want to receive the revelation, as Moses did. That is a revelation of the will of God for your life or for some decision. You have to go to where God is, as it were. You have to go up to go deeper with God. And some mountains you'll have to claim, as Caleb did, to receive your inheritance. And some you have to cast into the sea to receive an answer to your prayer by removing that mountain or that hindrance that's in the way to the answer. So let's look in these broadcasts at what mountains signify and what we're supposed to do with them. We are either to climb them, claim them, or cast them into the sea. First of all, mountains you have to climb if you want to receive the revelation, that is, if you want to go deeper with God. 
Have you ever wondered why God appeared on the top of Mount Sinai and required Moses to climb up to the mountain to receive the revelation? Or why Peter, James, and John had to climb the mount called the Mount of Transfiguration now to see Jesus' glory? You see, mountain climbing is hard work, it's exhausting, and the higher you go, the more difficult it becomes. Well, spiritually speaking, one must be willing to go up to where God is if he's to hear him speak, to have him reveal his will, to see his glory. Now, in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, we are informed that we must climb upon that mountain and die out like Moses did. That is, we must climb upon the altar, for here is where God promises to speak to us and reveal himself in a deeper way and reveal his perfect will. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Well, if we are to present ourselves as a sacrifice, that means we're to climb up on that altar, that mountain, as it were, and die out. And we are to be transformed, he said, by the renewing of our minds that we may prove what is that good an acceptable and perfect will of God. Now this altar of Romans 12 may not at first seem like a mountain until you try to climb upon it and stay there. And then for many people it becomes a formidable mountain to climb, which many find too high and the cost too great to attempt to climb it because after all, they know, as in the case of Moses who died on Mount Pisgah, it's going to result in their death. A lot of people have met death climbing mountains, and it's going to be no different for you. Now, most people think that Moses, because God forbade him to enter the promised land, never did get to enter, but he did. Yet it was after he died. He had to die to enter. Remember, on the Mount of Transfiguration, there he appears in the midst of the promised land with Elijah talking to Jesus about his forthcoming death. Now, if God's altar of the death of self looks as high as a mountain to you, say Mount Everest, I'll tell you why. It's because you're still standing at the bottom looking up. Mountains always look much higher from the bottom when you look up. But if you're willing to pay the cost submitting to the discipline of the mountain climbing preparation we're giving you week to week on these broadcasts, And as we give you in our literature and tapes, if you'll send for the book and tape list and get into a deep study of the Word of God, if you're willing to pay the cost of getting on top of that mountain, you'll find when you get to the top, and if you're willing to stay there for a while, you'll see that the clouds will begin to part and God's perfect will will become clearer and clearer to you and your eyes will begin to adjust to the distance and you'll find that by faith you can begin to see forever. But the problem lies in the fact that so many are seeking a shortcut up the mountain, trying to find another way, an easier way, and so they often end up in a dead end, an outcropping that they can't get around, and so they have to go back down to the base of the mountain and find out they're still where they were. And they get no revelation of God's perfect will. They do not see his glory. For example, you can't substitute the shortcut of seeking counseling from some minister or counselor about God's will for your life or some decision you have to make or the solution to some problem. You're seeking a shortcut for climbing upon the altar yourself and waiting for the clouds to clear and God give you the revelation. Now, counselors may be able to provide you with a short tour at the base of the mountain and describe some of its beauties for you or give you a bird's eye view of the mountain from a plane in the air but you're going to have to make the climb yourself with the equipment and preparation that we're trying to give you in these studies if you want to learn the perfect will of God. Now, not just his will about some decision or question, but we're talking about his end time will for your life. And just hearing us talk about it in these broadcasts won't give you the revelation of where or how you are supposed to fit in. No, if you want to go deeper with God, you'll have to climb up higher to where he is. I remember one brother telling me he waited on the altar for 12 long years from the time that God told him he had a supernatural ministry for him until that ministry opened. Dr. John G. Lake tells us of how 
He waited ten long years, as it were, on that mountaintop from the time that he claimed the gift of discernings of spirits, 1 Corinthians 12, until that gift began to operate in his ministry. Paul waited 14 years on the mountaintop, as it were, from the time of his conversion until his apostolic ministry began to function. We see in the case of Noah in Genesis 8 and 9 that he waited over 120 years from the time the command came to build the ark. From that time, it was 120 years until the ark was lifted up and then deposited on the top of Mount Ararat where he received another revelation. Read this in Genesis 8 and 9. And Moses waited 80 years from the time of his birth until he received the revelation on the top of Mount Sinai. And then when he finally got up there, he had to wait 40 days and nights to receive it all. Why? Well, you see, God could have revealed all of that to him in a moment of time, but there are two basic reasons why he required him to climb the mountain and then wait for 40 days and nights to receive it. And first of all, it's because God does not pass out his treasures like politicians do promises and passing out candy suckers to the kiddies. Because if God did, people would have about as much appreciation for his deep truth as to do the politicians' promises, which last about as long as the suckers they give the kiddies. And so while it took Moses 40 days and nights to receive the revelation, are you aware it took God several thousands of years to give us his word from Genesis to Revelation, what we call the Bible, including the fact that it cost him the lives of many of his prophets and the life of his own son? Now, if it took God several thousands of years to give us the revelation, then why are most Christians so naive as to think all they have to do is dial up the switchboard of heaven, as it were, to be put through to the throne of God, and then ask God to deliver some quick solution to their problem. Oh, they've got a problem they need an answer to right away. They expect God to drop everything, all of his dealings with this whole universe, and give them a revelation of his will, or some deep revelation of his truth, simply because they're asking for it. And they want it in a moment of time. It took God thousands of years to give the revelation, took Moses 40 days and nights waiting upon the revelation of the law, and yet some refused to spend 40 minutes in the Word of God or on their knees in prayer seeking a solution. So the second reason God does not pass out revelation just in a moment most of the time is because God does not operate on a production line schedule of dispensing His will, a revelation of His will, answers to problems, solutions and decisions you have to make for the same reason that he required Moses to stay 40 days on top of the mountain. And that is to give the people time to reveal what is in their heart before God will reveal what is in his heart. And you saw what happened in that 40-day proving period as Moses was on the mountain for 40 days. Within 40 days, the people had turned from the living God back to their idols of gold that they had picked up from man's religious system down in Egypt. Now, there are a lot of charismatic Christians that know there's still a great anointing to fall upon this world, upon the charismatic Christians, and why is God taking so long in preparing you then? Well, for the same reason. He's giving those who are coming under this end-time message of faith time to reveal what's in their heart before God reveals what's in his heart, his great power, glory, and anointing. For a free packet containing order forms and price lists,